Hey, Shalom, Israel, Brother Reggie Jr. here. So today, guys, I'm going to be reading Exodus chapter 30 and 31. I'm going to be reading these two chapters straight on through. I'm not going to be doing too much stopping just because, you know, these chapters are pretty much self-explanatory. I'll probably only stop if there's something that I really want to interject. But outside of that, man, we're going to just keep it moving. Now, as a disclaimer, outside you probably hear some music. I don't know if y'all can hear it or not, but we out here in Goshen, man. And on Sunday, they're supposed to be having, uh, Israel is supposed to be having some kind of freak nick. And you know Israel, they can't just wait to the day of to do the freak nick. They start a day before. They already be getting crunk. They start sitting outside, playing the music. Basically, it's a pre-freak nick. So if you hear some music, hey, that's exactly what they doing. They out there having a pre-freak neck, okay? Now, with that being said, back to um, Exodus 30 and 31. Look, man, I know sometimes some chapters that I read, they're not really that interesting. They're what you would call boring. But hey, nevertheless, these chapters that we feel is uninteresting, it's still the word of God. So we have a duty to read God's word, all of it. It doesn't matter if it's interesting or not. It's not a subject you want to look at. Uh-uh. You must read all of God's word. Because I'll tell you this right here. A lot of the chapters that y'all think is boring or uninteresting, those be the chapters that's got the most meat and the most jewels in them. But see, you skip over the chapters because you look at first glance and you're like, man, this don't, even to my measurements and some arc and lamps and all of that stuff like that, but you don't even realize them chapters, boy, they be filled with me. All right. So I had to get that off my chest and tell y'all that. Okay. But let's go ahead and get into this, uh, these two chapters, man, Exodus 30. And I'm going to read verse one. And it says, now I'm going to be reading verses one through 10. And these verses are talking about the altar of incense. It says, and thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Of shittim wood shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof. And a, a cubit the breadth thereof. Four square shall it be. And two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horns thereof shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold and you oftentimes seen that when it came to the Lord's temple and the things that uh, such as like the altar, the lamps and all of these things, the uh, the plates and all this stuff was all this stuff was like made out of gold, amethyst, rubies, pearls. Now you see why when and a lot of invading armies came into Israel, now you see why they was taking this stuff because. You know, the, hey, man, the, this stuff, man, was worth a lot of stuff. Pure gold, man, come on. And it says, and the horns thereof, and thou shalt make unto it a uh, crown of gold round about. Verse four. And two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it by the two corners thereof. Upon the two sides of it shalt thou make it. And they shall be for places for the staves to bear it withal. Because remember, this temple and everything that uh, is being laid out to Moses, th this is a, a temple that can be moved, all right? At least until we get to the temple Solomon built. But for what we know right now, these are all things that are going to be moving because remember Israel is going to be moving. They're going to be journeying. So they have to carry a lot of this stuff with them. Verse five. And thou shalt make the stays of shittim wood and overlay them with gold. Verse six. And thou, and, it, and, I, and I have to say this because, you know, in, in the heathens movies, they always depict the temple, you know, at least the one when Israel was traveling, they always depict the temple as looking shaggy, raggedy, and messed up, man. But when you really look, a lot of this stuff made out of gold, fine linen, all this stuff, man, this temple was clean. It looked awesome. It looked amazing. It ain't shabby like they depicted in the movies. Uh-uh. It looks good. I'm sorry, y'all, if the camera's like panning in and I don't know what's going on. Let me see. 
All right. I hope this darn camera don't give me no problems. It shouldn't, know. Technology is all good when it's working. But when it ain't, oh boy. Okay, but uh, let's keep on reading. Verse 6. And it says, And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. Verse 7. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning. Because remember, Aaron was the high priest. So every morning he had to burn sweet incense. When he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. Verse 8. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it. A perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Verse 9. Ye shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burn sacrifice nor meat offering neither shall ye pour drink offering thereon verse 10 and Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of the atonements and we know that Christ became that sin offering we know that Christ became that atonement for the children of Israel once and forever okay Let's go ahead real quick and let's just go to Romans chapter five and I'm going to read verse eight through 11. And it says, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't say, I'm going to wait for them to get right. Once they get right, then I'm going to die for them. I'll make an atonement for them then. Uh -uh. He made an atonement for us while we was yet sinners. Nine, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Okay, verse 10. For if when we were enemies were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. 11, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So a lot of stuff you see in Exodus, um, a lot of stuff you see um, in Leviticus, you know, these rituals and stuff, a lot of that stuff was pointing to Christ. All of these things were pretty much a schoolmaster, a shadow for things to come. When a person walks around the corner, what do you see first? You see their shadow first, and then you see them come, the actual person. Well, that's all the law and these rituals the Lord gave us. That's all it was. It was a shadow until the person to whom that shadow belonged to, which is Christ, would come. All right, but let's keep reading verse 11. 11 through 16 and this is talking about the offerings for the temple. And a lot of these offerings, too, um, you know, a lot of this stuff has a lot of meaning to them. If you can look past the surface, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, When thou takest the sum of the number of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord. When thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them, when thou numberest them. This they shall give, every one that passeth among them, that are numbered, half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is twenty garas, and half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. 14. Every one that passeth among them, that are numbered, from 20 years old and above shall give an offering unto the Lord. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when they give an offering unto the Lord. So we can see that God is a God of equity. Just because you're rich, you don't have to give more. And because you poor, that don't mean you give less. God is a God of equity. That's what I love about him. Fair to 
uh, when they, okay, let me just read 15 again. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. 16. And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. Okay. Verse 17. And it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash with all. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. And we always know that this water is always usually symbolic for the word of God. He means it literal, but I'm just always keeping that on your mind. Stuff like water, oil, a lot of that stuff is to my, the word of God. Or when they come near to the altar to minister to burn to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord. So they shall wash their hands and their feet that they die not. And it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. Okay. Verse 22. When it say to him and his seed throughout generations to my Aaron and his seed, not all 12 tribes. Aaron and his seed throughout all their generations. 22. Moreover, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half so much. Now, you, you probably wonder, where is Israel getting all of this stuff from? Remember, Israel spoiled the Egyptians. They greatly spoiled the Egyptians. That's where they get all this stuff from. Just thought I'd put that out there. And of sweet cinnamon, half of so much, even 250 shekels. And of sweet calamus, 250 shekels. 24. And of cassia, 500 shekels. After the shekel of the sanctuary. And of oil, olive, and of oil, olive, and hen. 25. And thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of apothecary. It shall be an holy anointing oil. 26. And thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony, and the table, and all his vessels, and the candlestick, and his vessels, and the altar of incense. And the altar of burnt offering with all his vessels and the laver in his foot. And thou shalt sanctify them that they may be most holy. Whatsoever touches them shall be holy. And thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, this shall be in holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. Neither shall you make any other like it after the composition of it. It is holy and it shall be holy unto you. Whosoever compoundeth any like it or whosoever putteth any of it upon a stranger shall even be cut off from his people. Verse 34. And the Lord spake unto Moses. I mean, the Lord said unto Moses, take unto thee sweet spices, staked, staked, and unca, and galbanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense. Of each shall there be a like weight, meaning an equal weight. 35. And thou shalt make it a perfume a confection after the art of apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy, and thou shalt beat some of it 
very small and put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation where I will meet with thee. It shall be unto you most holy. 37. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, he shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto, unto thee holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make like unto that to smear, smell thereunto shall even be cut off from his people. So it's serious, all right? Now that ends Exodus chapter 30. And now we're going to move into Exodus chapter 31 and we will be done. Exodus chapter 31. And this is going to be verses 1 through 11. And this is going to be talking about the appointment for the uh, children of Israel who is skilled to make these things. All right. So the Lord going to choose. Right. And it says, and Lord spake unto Moses, saying, see, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. What? To devise cunning works. So a lot of these gadgets and devices that we have, you're like, man, who came up with this? Who thought, thought of this stuff? God did. Don't look at the man who created. No, God gave man the wisdom to make this cell phone to make this computer. Think about this stuff. How does some metal pieces and all of that and some plastic and all of that stuff form a cell phone to where we can see ourselves in the cell phone? We can make calls and texts, uh, digital clocks, lamps and lights, cars where you press a pedal and it uses gas and it uses the gas and, and, and it propels the car forward and stuff like that. You really think man came up with this stuff. You are out your mind. No, God takes the wisdom from his mind and puts it into a man's mind to be able to create these things. And it says, but um, I have filled him with the spirit of God, verse four, to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver, and in brass. So I would even say the same thing even applies to those who are teaching the word of God. There are certain people that God raised up to teach his word. Not everybody up that's teaching is supposed to be teaching. That's why a lot of these brothers and these sisters, when you hear them up there, that's, that's why there's no no life in what they're saying. They don't have that it factor. Why? Because a lot of brothers and sisters are up teaching who should not be teaching. They were not called to do what they're doing. They just, a lot of them up because they want a big congregation. Some of them just want the money. Some of them want to be named among the other big time preachers. A lot of them are in it for the wrong thing. They are not called to teach, but they stand up there anyway. Okay, verse five. And in cutting of stones to set them and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. Verse six. And I, behold, I have given with him a holy, a holy ab, the son of a hissamet of the tribe of Dan. And in the hearts of all that are wise hearted, I have put wisdom. So this is of the Lord that they may that they may make all that I have commanded. Them. So these men ain't just smart and wise and intelligent on their own. No, the Lord made them that way for this very purpose. OK, verse seven, the tabernacle of the congregation and the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat that is thereupon and all the furniture of the tabernacle and the table and his furniture 
and the pure candlestick with all his furniture and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all his furniture and the laver in his foot. Verse 10, and the cloths of service and the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office and the anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place according to all that I have commanded thee, they shall do. So like I said in the previous chapters of Exodus when it came to building the temple and the, uh, the tabernacle and the things therein, God didn't just have no anybody making this stuff. No, God had put wisdom in the, the mind of men to be able to do a lot of this stuff. Because I'm going to let you know, I can't measure the back of my heel to my front toe. I'm so bad at measurements because guess what? God didn't put that in my mind to know how to do that stuff. But there are some men, they don't need a ruler or nothing. They can measure with their finger. Mm, mm, mm. So you need three fingers length. You need three fingers length of rod, and you will be able to make this, this, and this. How you think that man know that? Because God put that in his mind to be able to have a skill like that. God the one put that in his mind. Because I just tell you, I don't know how to do that kind of that kind of work welding and carpentry, knowing how to build, so understanding measurements. Can it be learned? Yeah. But there are just some people you like, okay, I know God made you for this specific reason. Okay. Now, verse 12 through 18, because it's going to talk about the Sabbath day. And it says, and the Lord spake unto Moses saying, speak thou also unto the children of Israel. He ain't talking to nobody else. He talking to the children of Israel saying, verily, truly. My Sabbaths ye shall keep. This is not optional. Why are you going to keep the Sabbath? For it is a sign. And what is a sign? A sign is something that identifies something. So it what? It's a sign between me and you throughout your generations. And what is that sign? That ye may know that I am the Lord that doeth sanctify or separate you. Because I, I'm telling you right now, the rest of these nations, they ain't keeping the Sabbath day. On the Sabbath day, all you got to do is look out and about in every nation under the sun. And you will see that these nations, they don't keep the Sabbath. That's what makes Israel different, though. All the nations doing whatever on the last day of the week. But when you look at God's people, the Israelites, the 12 tribes of Israel, they do something different. They shut everything down. They rest. They're not buying selling, trading. They're not doing their pleasures on the, on the seventh day of the week. That make people look and say, hmm, them people different. It's a sign that God is with them. Verse 14, it says, ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. He ain't talking about the nations. He to my Israel. Any of the Israelites that defile it shall be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, buying, selling, trading, doing God knows what on the Sabbath, he says, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. 15 says, six days may work be done. Okay, that's what God has permitted for the children of Israel, not for the nations, but for the children of Israel. He permitted us to work six days. He said, but for us, the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, holy unto the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, in the Sabbath day, because in the day is when you do your work. Because in the day is when you can see. I'm not talking about this Babylonian stuff. No, no, no. Especially during them time. They ain't have lights and all that stuff like we got. You operated in the daytime. That's when you did all your work. And when you seen night approaching, you went home. 
your work day was over. Or the Lord is saying, hey, on the seventh day, you ain't going to do no work. Just like them six days when the sun out, the light is out and you doing work. He said, hey, you ain't going to do that on the seventh day. That day is set aside for me. Holy to the Lord. Okay. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. 16. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. So he's talking to the 12 tribes. He's talking to us, not everybody, us. He said the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant because this Sabbath far proceeds Moses, it far proceeds Abraham, Noah, that thing go all the way back for Adam. The Sabbath been here. Verse 17. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. And you'll have people interject. You know, it's a sign between God and all of the nations who uh, keep the sub No, 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 no. He said it's going to be a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. And you can go read that back in Genesis. And it says, and on the seventh day, he what? Rested and was refreshed. 18, last verse. And he gave unto, and he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai. Remember, 40 days and 40 nights, Moses was up there. All right. So he was up there for like, what, a month and about a month, a week and three days. He was up there. And it says when he had made an end of communion with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of of God. Okay. And brothers and sisters, that is when that is when things are going to get really, really interesting in the next chapter. Okay. It's going to get real crazy and it's going to get real interesting. Now, um, that which was written on them uh, tables of stone there was them commandments. That's what was written on them stones. And he finna come and Moses finna come down with them tables and he gonna try, he gonna give them or was going to give them to the children of Israel. But something is going to end up happening. Okay. So uh, that is the end of those two chapters, guys. I hope y'all got some understanding and I will see you in chapter 32. Shalom.